Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Lovely to see you. The snow's gone, so that's good. <coughs> and um, welcome to the third of our Lent lectures. And um, of course, it's a great um, pleasure and privilege for it to be film grown. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, um, as I was thinking about um, the Bible texts, uh, I was thinking even more that to some extent, Julia's got the most difficult one. Certainly, it's by far the longest yeah. section, yeah. as you'll have noticed. So, you've got everyone behind you, you see. Um, and uh, so, probably, since there are about <coughs> twice as many verses as last week, the lecture will last twice as long. Uh, <laughs> I think that's unlikely. <laughs> but um, it's lovely to see one or two from other churches, so thank you for coming. You're very welcome. And thank you also for all the people who've been involved in setting up the room and providing the refreshments and for doing the audio visual um, uh, work. Richard, thank you. Um, you all have noticed how effective that's been on the website if you've had a look and wanted to, um, wanted to do a recap of the lectures we've heard, we've heard so far. This one will be on in due course, I think. So um, if you don't take it all in, don't worry. There's an opportunity to, um, to um, see it again. Uh, the other thing is that, that um, I think you've probably got copies of the slides. So you've probably been um, preparing yourselves and will know pretty much what's coming. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Julie. And we're thank really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. I think we should reserve judgment. <laughs> Well, controversy. Totally unknown to me. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been extra hard, and I do feel very hard done by. I have seven sections of really difficult text. So I'm going to whiz through them, um, and hopefully we will all come to a greater understanding of them uh, by the end of this hour. So, what I want you to do, first of all, please, is to shut your eyes and picture Jesus. And then, what do you see? So, look at the screen. Here. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, perhaps. Or, Jesus looking a bit sinister. <laughs> Jesus the He-Man. <laughs> Robert Powell with the wonderful blue eyes. Oh. And another. What about this? Jesus on his white charger coming in the clouds. The winter shawl, Jesus. The Jesus of the icons. Perhaps the first ever depiction uh, of Christian art. Then another really weird depiction of the transfiguration. And Jesus with, I think it's angel wings. I think he's borrowed mine. <laughs> <laughs> and here, Jesus on top of buildings. Jesus holding animals, a la Franciscans. Jesus looking pensive. Jesus with the heart shining forth. Jesus with post ascent or post resurrection of people holding on to him and another depiction of Jesus looking up to heaven. But now, how do you react to these? Much more controversial depictions of Jesus. So, my blood at the top. Alexander Kosmopov. What do you think of that one? Or, down below. A depiction by Argentinian artists of Barbie and Ken as religious figurines. And this one was absolutely hated, obviously, by um, especially by certain sectors of Christian denominations. Then we have dogma. <laughs> and Buddy Jesus. Here he is. And last but not least, we have the church's advertising network and an ecumenical
ecumenical network created in 1991, and this was their ad for Easter in 1999. Jesus as Che Guevara. Are you just going to say that? Have you got the Che Guevara? And I wonder what you make of that. It was so controversial, but it brought a lot of people into church just to see what everybody was going on about. So, controversy. Jesus, you should know, has caused controversy since the very beginning of his ministry in Mark's Gospel. He's done that by what he said right from the beginning of his ministry. Chapter 1, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. His very first words. And also by what he did. So he went out, having said that, and he cures a man with an unclean spirit, and that unclean spirit calls him the Holy One of God. And he angers the religious authorities so much that almost from the beginning of the Gospel, the Pharisees and the Herodians conspire to destroy him. And later on in the Gospel, having ridden into Jerusalem, being angry and cleansing the temple, which was at the very heart of the Jewish religion, he begins to teach. And here we get to Mark chapter 12. So what he teaches falls into seven sections, which we're going to look at. And throughout the whole of this chapter, there runs a note of hostility and tension. The underlying theme is the authority of Jesus, which we heard about in last week's lecture. And what we have before us is a series of conflict stories. And it's Jesus' teaching here that is matching his activity. So he's justifying what he did in the temple. That brings him under scrutiny. And what we should note is that not only does he respond to controversial questions and traps laid by the religious leaders, but he also needles them by creating controversy. So this is indeed the point of no return. So I'm going to ask John to read the first one, and that's the parable of the tenants. If you've got the text, it's verses 1 to 12. <coughs> then Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat, and others they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. When they realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd. So they left him and went away. Thank you, John. This then is what we call an allegorical story. It's a piece of writing, a story, a poem or a picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning. Usually, typically, a political one, here a moral one. And the point is about the failure of Israel's religious leaders to accept God's messengers. And it has so many resonances with the past. Notably, a long line of prophets, and especially Isaiah chapter 5, who wrote a song about a vineyard, 
which was meant to be Israel <coughs> itself. So the people that should have produced the fruit of justice and right living have instead produced the wild grapes of wickedness and violence. And the parable ends with punishment. Punishment of the tenants and the meaning becomes clear. Those who reject God's messengers will themselves be rejected. Others will inherit the vineyard. So in, through this story, Jesus is explaining why he's done, what he's done in the temple. He's signifying that the temple will be destroyed, but his kingdom work will go on and be justified by events which happen to him. And so this time, the echo moves into Psalm 118. Incidentally, the same psalm as they sang when Jesus entered Jerusalem. And that psalm speaks of a stone, a stone perhaps lying in the builder's yard, but the wrong shape to fit anywhere into the wall. And only when the builders get to the very top and look for a cornerstone, the keystone of an arch, do they realise too late that the stone they ignored is now the very stone that they need. So what does this mean? Well, there are loads of interpretations, but perhaps Jesus is saying he's come to Jerusalem with the message of God's kingdom. But this message doesn't simply fit into the building of Judaism, the way in which the present builders, the chief priests, Herod, the Pharisees, the Sadducees and the scribes have constructed it. And they will realise too late that Jesus belongs at the foundation or at the very top of the building, because cornerstone can actually mean either. By then, it will be too late. The current tenants will have been destroyed. The vineyard will be given to others. And what we should notice is the reaction of the religious leaders in verse 12. This really is the turning point. It's the point of no return for Jesus. Because the reference to the sending of a beloved son, albeit veiled, would make them realise that Jesus was making, yes he was, making a messianic claim. And that seals Jesus' fate and their own. So they want to arrest him. And Jesus' teaching produces then the same result as had his actions when he cleansed the temple. And this is so full of traumatic irony. Because this parable is then acted out in the passion narrative that follows. Because in seeking to destroy Jesus, in fact, the authorities only succeed in destroying themselves. So, we might think this is an old story. What does it say to us? Nothing to do with us whatsoever. But I wonder... What messages has God been sending to us, personally and corporately, that we ignore? All sorts of things might come and spring to mind. Things about prophetic words, about speaking out. Do we have courage? Which voices have you done your best not to hear? So we'll just reflect on that for a moment. I'll take questions at the end. John, then, could you read the next section, please, which is verses 13 to 17. Then they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality, 
but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me see it. And they brought one. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Jesus said to them, Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. So here is Jesus the clever corpse, being able to refute all the questions that can be thrown at him. So I wonder how you would react to that. So first of all, who are the Pharisees and who are the Herodians? The Pharisees were a strict religious sect, mostly ordinary Jews, they weren't priests, they were strict observers of the law, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. And they were the guardians of the oral traditions that scholars had developed over generations. But the Herodians were a group that supported the Roman leader, King Herod Antipas, who reigned from 4 BC to AD 39. And he did so in exchange for political favour and peace. So the Herodians were at the opposite extreme to the Zealots. The Zealots believed that God alone should lead Israel and resorted to activism and military opposition to end Roman control. But the Herodians, by their name, acted with the Roman leader to secure that favour and peace. So, this question and the next three show Jesus teaching with authority. The authority that he claimed, as we heard in our lecture last week, by dealing with every possible kind of question thrown at him. And he demonstrates his superiority to everybody, everyone who opposes or questions him, because unlike theirs, his is an authority from heaven. So these questions unpack at a historical level the story that was depicted in allegorical form in the parable of the vineyard. So what's it all about? Well, interestingly, the fact is it's all about a poll tax, a cane sauce, a tax imposed on the population of Judea, Samaria and Idumea <coughs> in AD 6, when these districts became a Roman province under the rule of a procurator. <clears throat> and this was regarded, of course, by the Jews as an outrageous act of interference by foreign rulers. In time, it gave rise to the revolt of AD 70, when the temple was destroyed and the Jews were yet again taken and put into the dispersion. So what's the trap? Well, the trap is clear. If Jesus sides with the Jews who oppose the tax, he'd be denounced by the Romans. He'd be arrested as a political agitator. But if he sides with the Romans, he loses popular support. And his smart-ass reply accepts legitimate demands of the Roman government because those who use Roman coins clearly owe some kind of allegiance to Caesar. But he switches our attention to the more important demands of God. So if we look back to the previous parable, Jesus is making the subtle but controversial point that the religious leaders have consistently refused to give God what they should. Now down the centuries, this story has been used in a variety of ways, 
but especially in the 18th century, it became fashionable to see it as a story saying that church and state are separate entities. But this was a later <coughs> idea and only became popular then because Jewish thought at the time of Jesus and Christian thought as it emerged within Judaism has always seen the entire world as created by one God. There is no such thing as state and religion. All aspects of the world and its rule fall under God's sovereign rule. <clears throat> there is nothing outside of that. So the questions that I think this poses were the reaction of the crowds. Were they amazed by his authority? Perhaps were they amazed that he was prepared to take on the religious leaders? Or did they like his cleverness? And what aspects of life today are we tempted to believe to be separate from matters of faith? Because we are very good at <coughs> compartmentalising our lives and seeing lots of things outside of the purview of religion and none of religion's business, especially in England at the present time. What happens today when religious leaders speak out is the question. So, that's two, only five more. <laughs> So we're now going to move on to the most tricky, probably, section of all. This is the, the question about the resurrection. So, John, could you read, please, verses 18 to 27? Some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no child, the man shall marry the, the widow and raise up children for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first married, and when he died, left no children. And the second married her and died, leaving no children. And the third likewise. None of the seven left children. Last of all, the woman herself died. In the resurrection, whose wife shall, will she be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Is not this the reason you are wrong, that you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the story about the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is God, not of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Can I just say, too, that I think somebody's getting at me because I had something yesterday with a woman having five husbands. <laughs> so I'm beginning to wonder what message this is giving to me. So here we are. This odd story, continuing the theme of controversy, which takes a huge amount of explanation, and I will try to do my best. First of all, who are the Sadducees? The Sadducees were the Jewish priestly aristocracy. They tended to be wealthy, and they were powerful. They included the chief priests and the high priests, and they held the majority of the 70 seats on the ruling council, which was called the Sanhedrin. And they worked hard to keep the peace by agreeing with the decisions of Rome. Religiously, they were conservative. The Pharisees gave oral tradition equal authority to the written word of God. But the Sadducees considered only the written word of God to be authoritative and especially the Torah. So they were conservative and they distrusted anything new and progressive. 
So whilst the Pharisees entertain the idea of resurrection, which we know from the book of Acts, the Sadducees vehemently opposed it. Do we know why? Well, we think the idea of resurrection, God bringing dead people back to life, might mean a root and branch transformation of the whole world. And there was no guarantee that those who are presently in power would retain it in the new order. In fact, if they listened to what Jesus was saying, the likelihood was that those in the front would end up at the back, and vice versa. And if people started believing that sort of nonsense, the Sadducees reckoned, well, <coughs> there was no knowing what they might go and do. So in order to rubbish an idea that they're frightened of, they tell a silly story to show how ridiculous it is. So they come up with this story of the childless wife with seven husbands and ask, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Now this question is based on the law about Leviterate marriage in Deuteronomy, whereby Moses taught that if a man leaves a wife but has no children, his brother should marry that wife in order to raise up children. So the law was intended to provide a man with heirs to preserve his name and to inherit his property. And the Sadducees' point is that Moses didn't believe in the resurrection, obviously. Jesus' reply falls into two parts. He says, firstly, that the whole point of resurrection isn't that, is that it isn't just a coming back into a present life, with its marrying and childbearing, because in God's new world, those who rise from the dead will be like angels. They won't need to marry, because there's no more death and no more children. But secondly, and this is the real point, which is whether or not the dead will be raised. Because what the Sadducees were trying to get at was that Moses didn't believe in the resurrection. And so Jesus takes them back to the story of the burning bush, where God declares to Moses he's God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we know that he's God of the living and the not the dead. And so, no, 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 they're wrong. So, Jesus says that the Sadducees understand neither the power of God, which is presumably to raise the dead, or the scriptures, and especially that book of Exodus. So God was launching through Jesus his new sovereign saving rule. Everything was going to be turned upside down. The Sadducees' power base, the temple, was going to be destroyed. And God was going to set up Jesus himself and his followers as the radical new alternative. And that's a bit like resurrection in advance. God's <coughs> new life on earth as in heaven. So, the questions which strike me are about the power of God. <coughs> what is this power of God? And how does God reveal his power today? How is the spirit working in the church at the moment? What is the spirit saying to us about what we should be doing? Right, John, thank you. We're on to the law, verses 28 to 34. <laughs> One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbour as yourself. 
There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbour as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. So what about this law? Is this an easier passage to understand? Well, we'll see. First of all, who are the scribes? Well, they weren't a sect and they weren't a political party. They were simply legal experts called lawyers and teachers. And Mark normally doesn't like them. But here we have one who he says is asking an honest question. So that's to be, to be noted. But scribes copied the law and interpreted <coughs> the law and they applied it to everyday life. So the question that the scribe put to Jesus was commonly discussed amongst rabbis at the time. And the issue isn't which of the commandments was the most important, because all were important and all had to be kept. It was actually whether there was some basic principle from which the whole law could be derived. And actually, Jesus' reply was fairly unremarkable. For Jesus to answer with the matchless Shema prayer from Deuteronomy 6, 4-5, which was recited still his daily by pious Jews, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And then to append it with Leviticus 19:18 love your neighbour as yourself, was quite a safe answer. But it's the legal expert who, as he thinks what Jesus has said, and as he works out what Jesus has done, goes one step further and makes the all-important connection. Because he ponders, if you really <coughs> love God, and if you love your neighbour as yourself, actually, you won't need the sacrificial system, will you? And Mark doesn't say that Jesus smiled, but he might have been forgiven for doing so. Because the deep understanding of the legal expert was exactly in line with the deep understanding of Jesus himself about the whole purpose of his mission. So just like the Sabbath, which was a signpost pointing forward to the great rest, the restoration of the whole creation, the food laws designed to keep Israel pure until the time when purity of heart was to be at last attainable, so too the temple was designed by God as a temporary symbol until the ultimate reality had, revived, had arrived. And the whole point of Jesus' kingdom proclamation was that the time of waiting was over. So he is now offering to anybody and everybody who will hear and believe the reality to which the temple was a signpost. So the kingdom of God is the new reality in which those who believe will love God with every fibre of their being and their neighbours as themselves. So the temple is redundant. And in Jesus' eyes, the scribe isn't far from the kingdom. His attitude is the right one. But the passage enables us to understand more fully what Jesus thought his work was all about and how his mission was bound to challenge the centrality of the temple and its sacrificial system. This was a highly controversial, dangerous thing to suggest. 
But Jesus really did believe that through his kingdom mission, Israel's God would enable people to worship and love him and to love one another in a new way, the way promised by the prophets, the way that stemmed from renewed hearts and lives. So the questions that this makes me ask are, are these. Jesus said the temple, there was no more need for the temple, so what are we doing putting all our effort into buildings? Interesting that for the first 200 years, there were no church buildings in Christianity at all. And if the answer comes back, well, we know really that it's the people that make the church and not the building, then the question becomes, does our concern for our neighbour, our love of God too, really exceed our concern for what happens in church on a Sunday morning? And when so many of us have strong views about what worship should or shouldn't be like, what does this passage say about our priorities? And I think that is a huge challenge to us. So John, moving on please, about David's son. Just these three verses. While Jesus was teaching in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how can he be his son? And the large crowd was listening to him with delight. Yet another impossible bit of text. So Jesus now poses a question himself about messiahship. And some have seen a denial, this is a denial of Jesus' descent from David. I think it can't be, because elsewhere in Mark, Jesus is called Son of David. So it's not a denial of Jesus' Davidic descent, but what it is, is an affirmation of Jesus' Lordship, which made him superior to the political Messiah of Jew Jewish patriotic hopes, superior then to David himself. So it isn't that it, it denies it, it transcends it, if you will. There's no excuse for those who fail to see Jesus as their Lord. So if we try to work out a bit more, to it out what this means, we look at Romans chapter 1 verse 3, where we hear that Jesus was descended from David according to the flesh. And that's the important one. But he was designated son of God in power according to the spirit. So son of David, earthly, and son of God, heavenly, are complementary. Jesus' Davidic descent isn't denied, but the fact he's son of God is actually much more important. And the quote is from Psalm 110. And the passage implies that Jesus is to be seen as Lord. And this reminds us of the book of Malachi, which speaks of the Lord coming to his temple, which actually runs through this whole section. And it's significant that it's in the temple that Jesus comes closest in St. Mark's Gospel to revealing his true identity than anywhere else in the entire book. But it is hard to work out what he's actually saying. But the questions are these. Who do you say that Jesus is? Well, I'll come on to this a bit later. Is it important to you that Jesus is both earthly, son of David, and heavenly, son of God, two natures? Why is it important? And what questions do you have about the person of Jesus as opposed to 
his message. But we must move on because he then attacks the teachers of the law. Thank you, John. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honour and banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Mischievously, I'd just like to point out the long prayers. <laughs> long prayers, apparently no good. Right, okay. So, hypocrisy is what Jesus is condemning here. But we've seen that not all the scribes were guilty of hypocrisy, but Jesus is critical of those who show false piety. False party which acts as a cloak to injustice. Once again, we have echoes of Malachi, where the Lord comes in judgment to the temple. And the scribes apparently wore a particularly long version of the talith, the outer garment, when they were at prayer or engaged in carrying out their duties. So they're condemned here for parading their religion in order to be seen and admired. So clergy, question to us, when we wear our robes, are we parading our religion in order to be seen? See, there's one, there's one smiling and nodding, and none will be going, very interesting. But it's an interesting question, which is raised. Another group of scribes exploit the poor. They devour widows' houses. They're worthy of even greater condemnation because those who parade their piety are guilty of silly ostentation. But those who oppress the defenceless are certainly failing not only to love God, but their neighbours also. And they will receive the greater condemnation. So why do you think Jesus focuses so much on hypocrisy? And what would he say, not just the clergy, but to any, all of us, about hypocrisy? In what ways are we hypocritical? Do our deeds match our words? And how can we change? Right, John, the next one, please. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Thank you. So here's the contrast. The leaders and the people. So in contrast to those who exploit poor widows, we have the widow who sacrifices all that she has. And Jesus commends the widow for her offering. So how does this foreshadow Jesus' own sacrifice? Interesting too that he uses the example of a woman. For what we know in theory but often forget in practice is that what counts isn't the amount, but the proportion. So the rich shell out large sums, but it's a small percentage. The widow put in a tiny sum, but the maximum percentage. 
and she was prepared to go without herself rather than stint on giving what she could to God. So this illustration is of true worship and generosity and it stands in sharp contrast not only to the rich who give large sums but a small percentage but also to the scribes condemned for their ostentatious piety. So as a result of her total self-giving, the widow becomes the example par excellence of that total love for God which Jesus is speaking about. So why is this incident placed here? Well, it's the last story before Jesus' prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem linking back to the story about loving God and the neighbour. And perhaps Jesus is saying that the reality to which the temple points is in place. Here is someone who loves God with every fibre of their being. Therefore, the temple has served its purpose and Jesus fulfils it. But God's generosity to us is that he gave himself. And the question is, how much do we truly give back of ourselves to him? So you can see the question is there absolutely self-evident. If God gave up, up us himself, how much are we prepared to give back to him? And do we give out of our superfluity, or do we give sacrificially? And I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about ourselves, our very beings. And what should our discipleship cost us? Again, not just money, but in every way. So, that is a whiz through the text. And let's now move on for the last five minutes or so to think about the overall chapter. So why did Jesus provoke controversy? Was it because he enjoyed needling people, challenging people? Was it because that he thought the religious leaders of the people were barking up the wrong tree and leading the people astray? Was it that because he thought his people, especially the clever and well-off, had become insincere in their religious observance? Was it to get their attention? Just what was it that made him such a controversial figure? And have we dumbed him down today? So what's your reaction to these stories? Do you find the portrayal of Jesus as angry, as controversial? Does that challenge you? Does it make you feel uncomfortable? Is it something that you sooner not think about? How does it affect your picture of what Jesus is? And I can never talk about this without saying, what would Jesus do today? What would Jesus speak out about to us today in 21st century Britain? What message would he give to us? How would he challenge us? What's the challenge to us today, right here and now? And what is he saying to each one of us gathered this evening? So here are some quotes about controversy. First of all, Martin Luther King. <coughs> the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. 
And Martin Luther King knew all about that. And then a more up-to-date one by Kirk Cameron, who's a, an actor uh, in the States. I think controversy isn't always a bad thing. Jesus was controversial. It's through controversy that people often wake up and smell the coffee and say, what's going on here? Do we need to rethink something? Are we challenged in other words? And this amazing quote from C.S. Lewis about courage. Courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at its testing point which means at the point of highest reality. A chastity or an honesty or mercy which yields to danger will be chaste or honest or merciful only on conditions. Pilate was merciful till it became risky. So what risks are you prepared to take for Jesus? And then, Some 19th and 20th century controversies about Jesus and his message. This is part of my PhD, um, <clears throat> and this whole section raises the question that I've been thinking about. Because in the uh, 19th and 20th century, there arose a, a movement which tried to separate the Jesus of history from the Jesus of faith. And a group of scholars, especially German scholars, but some English ones too, began to try to peel back the layers to get back to the historical Jesus and to try to see whether there were things that were absolutely essential to the faith and things that were peripheral that were needed to be re-expressed in different contexts, different ages and different ways. Some of them took it really very far indeed. And one of them was this guy, Adolf von Harnack. So it was called The Colonel and the Husk. Is there an essential gospel message linking us with the early church, but needs to be expressed and presented differently in different times, places, and cultures? So, for example, Harnack would say that all the things about the judgment of the Jews and all the things to do with the Jewish religion were the, the Christ of faith and not part of Jesus' original message. And for Harnack, it was essential to distinguish between what was the message of Jesus and that which is incidental and bound by historical circumstance. So for Harnack, the essence of Christianity is the fatherhood of God, the infinite worth of the human soul, and the ethical ideal of the kingdom of God within believers. And I wonder if that rings any bells. It's a bit like, love God with every fibre of your being, and your neighbour as yourself. So, what's missing? Well, this is, this is what I've just enunciated as at the heart of Harnack's theory. So what do we notice that's missing from this? Well, of course, it's any statement about who Jesus actually was himself, the Christ of faith. So if it was me to add to the essence of the gospel, I'd want to say, Jesus Christ, who lived, died, and rose again from the dead, promised that all who believe in him would inherit eternal life, and use John 3.16. And then, the essence of Jesus' message was, love God with every fibre of your being, and your neighbour as yourself. And that, for me, actually encapsulates what our bishop is trying to get at with his three C's, I think, because the contemplation part, if we're going to be, I should explain, sorry. Our bishop has called us to be a Christ-like church, and he's worked out three qualities that he thinks a Christ-like church should be like. We should be contemplative, compassionate, and courageous. 
If we're contemplative, then we will think about how much our love for God fires our every thought, word, and deed. If we're going to be compassionate, we will reach out to our neighbours as ourselves. But all that takes, especially in our age and our society, takes real courage. And that's where the courageous church comes in. So, thank you for listening. There we are. courageous than we are at present. If we want our church to survive, we are going to have to go out and <coughs> communicate the good news in a better way than we're doing at the moment. Um, and I think God's been sending it. And it's not, as I said yesterday, it's not complicated, actually. It's much simpler than it seems, especially if you take John 4 and the woman of the well as an example of how you do it. It starts with a very simple standing alongside, and then it moves gradually on. Uh, but it's all to do with relationship, but it takes courage. It, it means that the whole church, each one of us, each and every one of us, has to engage with other people about our faith. And I think that's the message we're ignoring, both corporately and individually. And the clergy are hugely responsible for not enabling the team to see both how and that they should do that. Thank you. Thank you. Are you coming on, mate? <laughs> 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 we're all agreed that Jesus was controversial. There's, it, was, it seems to me that particularly the Church of England, but the Christian Church, but particularly the Church of England, is utterly uncontroversial, isn't that the word? Uh, it, it, you, you never, there's never any mention of the Church of England in, in a political context, or rarely in this country. You, other countries you go to in the world, and the headlines are made by the Christian Church, but in this country it's so rare. Mm -hmm. and I'm a bit of a news junkie, I'm, I read the, a lot of BBC West, news websites, and it's incredibly rare that any mention is made of Christianity. Yep. And, and I, I think, you know, if, let's say it seems that Jesus was controversial, uh, that, that there should be more. I don't know what your thought is. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, you know, I want to see our bishops speaking out on all sorts of things. Because I think, you know, there's no such thing as anything outside the purview of, of religion. And we should be able to speak out on anything. But we should be prepared to stand up and defend what we're speaking about. You know, if you're going to speak out, you've got to back it up with, with solid living and live out the message that you're speaking about. And um, I would much sooner too have our bishops make mistakes and get absolutely ridiculed for it than not speak out at all. And I think people are emasculated at the moment and they're frightened to speak out. And I don't quite know why, because. We should be. So, write to the bishop. Tell him to speak out. <laughs> <laughs> or come in two weeks and tell him in person. Yeah, tell him, yeah, come in two weeks. Tell him that 
and he's doing a good job at the House of Lords. He's speaking out about artificial intelligence, which is what Olivia was speaking about last week. But we really need to be up there and thinking hard about what this means, both the, the advantages, but the threats that it poses too, and voicing those as, as much as we can. Just one very small example. Am I allowed to add a comment? No. It's interesting that um, one of the reasons that there is not a lot of coverage about what bishops say is that it's arguable that the BBC is strongly anti-Christianity. Yeah. And you have to bear that in mind. The BBC is not a paragon of unprejudiced reporting. No, just because of the BBC. No, fair enough. <laughs> um, but, all right, well, but probably the media broadly. Uh, is not terribly, in this country, is not terribly interested in religion uh, unless it relates to fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. That was all I wanted to know. That's fine. I could not have a question if you like. No, no, it's all right. <laughs> it's all right, because Julian has one. Julian, it's a better be kind question. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, if Jesus was around today, what do you think his relationship would be like with the media? With what do you think it would be like? Thank <laughs> 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 you, Julian. So kind. He would but ask the awkward question. He would and they would have to answer. Yes, yeah. and I think he'd tell the media, surely, to focus on, to be kinder to everybody yeah. in the way in which yeah. they... Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. fed up to the back teeth of turning on the television, any sort of news related programme and have the media absolutely gunning for people in a, in a you know, not just a controversial way, but a really destructive way. And I don't mind people being cross-questioned, but it seems that they are determined to, to expose people and find them what's wrong about them and the bad in them. Just to sell papers. <laughs> just want to sell papers and to get people to listen. And I really don't think it's helpful. They're like they're I, don't they? Yes. I was going to say, I see the, the, the sort of clever blogs and the smart asses today. I mean, the ones in Jesus' time, the Herodians, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, who you mentioned. But I think the, the, the sort of smart asses and the clever blogs today are actually the media. And so you can see a relationship similar to the way Jesus was relating to the Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians. Uh, and that would be, I think, similar today to the, the media and Jesus. So and do you think they'd be trying to catch him out and this sort of stuff? Sure, I'm sure they would. Do you think we should be much more media savvy, though, as a church? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think Jesus was so ever so, I think he was so careful when he did speak. So when he did speak, it was very powerful. So I don't think that he would be uh, feeling that he had to be used to on the news channels every day. But when he did speak, you know, people got the message loud and clear. So I think he was incredibly savvy and he would be media savvy, yeah, which is very wise. I, I think the question, why did Jesus provoke um, controversy, could be taken one or two ways. It could be implied as asking why Jesus deliberately sought to provoke controversy. Yeah. Or perhaps why things were essentially quite simple, honest, straightforward things to say happened to be controversial in that particular time. Yep. And I think we might be rather exaggerating how complicated uh, we need to act in order to be controversial. I think um, society has become so decadent that we could do really quite simple things which would themselves be controversial, whether that's not overindulging children at Christmas and encouraging things to be given away, helping neighbours, reading at school, um, helping you know, young people not in education, employment or training, all of these things, if we were to invest our time in them individually, would against the backdrop of quite a decadent world be controversial in themselves. So I don't think we should overcomplicate what we need to do to be different at an individual level. I, I appreciate there are organisational things to be done, yeah. but I would encourage us all to think individually as well. Absolutely, yeah, well, thank you for that, Tim, and I think that's absolutely true. And I think probably one of the ways in which I'm saddest 
the Church of England, in my view, has lost it, is through schools. Because, um, you know, we are trying our damnedest to work hard in the schools in this parish. Um, and, and we're lucky that all the schools are ready to welcome us and to work with us. But the fact that we've lost so much of assemblies, of collective worship, of the way in which religion was a real part of school life up to about 30 years ago, I think is one of the things that Jesus would be highly critical of us of, you know, about. Because we had a real opportunity and we simply sold it out and lost it. And getting it back is just much more difficult. Much, much more difficult. And um, I see that as a real sorrow because when we have people coming for baptism, for example, now, um, you, you have to, you, you can't assume anything. You know, whereas before you would, uh, you would, you would, get a basic knowledge, because that's the way in which they were schooled, these days you, you can't assume anything like that. And it makes, does it make it more, it does make it more complicated because you're talking to people on so many different levels and it's very easy to patronise them if you're not careful. Um, whereas some people these days have virtually no knowledge of Christianity whatsoever and they've grown up within our, our, our school system. And there's only for us to be apologetic about it, because I think parents are crying out for an antidote to the stress and commercialism of modern yeah. life. I think it's reached a breaking point for a lot of people, and it's a, 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 a very opportune time to, to really push it rather hard than we have in a less apologetic way than that. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Absolutely. I would say that, that Jesus, um, Jesus' message is love God and, and love the neighbour. And if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and will give you eternal life, then you should listen to his message. And if, if we all try to love God and love our neighbour, indeed without being Christians, the world would certainly be a better place even so. So what's there to lose? I was just thinking you were talking about going into schools and the fact that um, you don't know what good you do but surely now you are sowing seeds maybe not yeah. for our time but for generations to come and perhaps that maybe we are the sowers now yeah I would hope so yeah. absolutely definitely but I think, it, again, it, it's very difficult to, these days, know, it was much easier in the past, when I started in ministry 30 years ago, to know where to pitch things. Yeah. Because, you know, you, you would have a, a much more basic knowledge. These days it's much more difficult to know where to pitch anything in a school. Because, yeah, and then, you know, you, you, it, it's just much more difficult. Um, I just always keep coming back to the fact that, especially now, uh, generally society is scared, scared witless about religion because of fundamentalism and things going on over the world. But I always keep coming back to Christ didn't come and start a religion. He already was in a religion. He was a Jewish man. And he was very faithful to his, you know, to, to that religion and God. And um, he came to show the way. And just by reflecting that in everything we do, because we love God and we love him, and we re that's the way to show others, just by being and doing. <coughs> you know, it, it just comes back to the Beatles, doesn't it? All you need is love. It's just, it's, for me, it is that simple. And I think someone said about we overcomplicate it. Yeah. And that's true. It's just very, very simple. 
But it's also is society, do they just ignore that? Oh, aren't you lovely and kind? Aren't you really good? That's a nice thing you're doing. But like you say, that's the way in to say, yes, because I'm doing what Jesus taught. I think the one area that actually might fit now with society is there are so, so, so many programmes. I love, as Richard will testify, I love fantasy and sci-fi and I love horror movies and stuff like that. Isn't this just fantastic? You as the son of God, man, lived, died and came back. I mean, is that not The Walking Dead and sci-fi? It is. It is. <laughs> it is. It's like the ultimate zombie movie, isn't it, really? In a, in a beautiful way, in, in a really good, like, shining version, as opposed to decaying version. But is that not a way in? Is that not a conversation? Oh, they kind of did not. Is it not? I don't know. Tom is nodding. 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 Tom is You're absolutely right, you should use every opportunity you can to open a conversation on the most banal topic if necessary. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely fine. So, so yes, I'd agree on that. Fine. Looks as though we may have run out of questions. Oh! That's <laughs> 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 um, well, Julie, thank you very much for tackling this long and complex passage and for um, doing so much detailed biblical um, analysis and exposition, all of which I suspect um, will have taught us something or other that, that we would never have picked up just by looking at these individual um, teachings on their own, as we tend to do um, on a Sunday in the church, and to see the wide scope of it and the way in which um, all... All of them are, are kind of brought together in Jesus' central message, which oughtn't to have been a controversial one, but it was no less controversial then, more so probably, than it, than it is today. All of that, I think, is um, you, you, you did so well to, um, to bring it all together in that way. And, and I think if I've got it right, there are about 18 questions for us to take away. <laughs> I do like questions. I'm not good on answers, but I do like questions. Uh, and, and I think the thing that is, has been evident from all these first three lectures is how much... Um, I mean, Julie is attached to the parish, so she has a bit of an obligation, but the others who have come have put in so much work, as has Julie, to, to present something which could have been overcomplicated, which, which, which um, could have been kind of um, slapdash in a way, but wasn't. It, this is hours and hours of work which we've had the benefit of. So, so thank you very much. Um, we'll give you a round of applause in a moment. But just to say that um, next week it's Bishop Allen, and I would be extraordinarily surprised if he doesn't say something just modestly <laughs> controversial. <laughs> Occasionally, I think probably he, he reaches his own point of no return. <laughs> but, but whatever it is, it will be stimulating. And um, he is talking about anointing. So um, let's say a prayer. That's Absolutely. all right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the richness of the account of Jesus' final week that we've been learning about this evening and in the pre previous two weeks. We thank you that this message has been passed down to us so vividly and so strongly and that it resonates for our own lives today. Help us to think about what Julius told us this evening, to reflect on the character of Jesus what he means to us, what he means to our churches now and in the future. We ask all this in his name. Amen. Amen. I've uh, popped a basket on the table outside if anybody would like to make a contribution to expenses. Uh, otherwise, I don't think I've got anything else to announce unless anyone tells me differently.
Um, thank you very much to all those people who have signed up to do the refreshments. The rotary is now complete, which is wonderful. And all being well, we look forward to seeing as many of you as can come next week. So, Judy, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.